I have shared before that I have struggled my entire life with being a pessimist. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh, that's all right. I have. Uh, and I, you know, through years of trying to figure myself out and therapists and counselors and mentors, I've tried to figure out why, why do I have this uh, certain bent towards pessimism. Some pieces of me think that it goes to being the youngest of four, you know, and you kind of, when you're the youngest four and, you know, mom and dad are struggling to make ends, you kind of get left out a lot, you know? It's always, you don't get the new clothes, you get the hand-me-downs, right? And when you're the youngest, it's like, well, you're not old enough. So I got used to all these little pieces of disappointment. I also think it had to do with being a Minnesota Vikings fan. <laughs> 1970s, in my childhood, four Super Bowls, no wins. What made matters worse is in the Methodist church where I grew up, Reverend Washington uh, constantly prophesied from the pulpit who was going to win the playoffs and the Super Bowl, and he was a Steelers and Cowboys fan. <laughs> so I naturally began to realize that there is something sinful about being a Minnesota Vikings fan, because obviously they don't win. And I can remember, I can remember watching the Super Bowl in 1978 against the Oakland Raiders, and, and once again, we're going to lose. And I walked into the, the furnace room next to the basement and just began to cry, and it's like, why me? Why me? Now, is that not a picture of self-centeredness? And don't we do that as fans? Remember that, remember that ad campaign that, that, that they had out here a year or so ago? It's only stupid if it doesn't work. You know, we have all these superstitions because we believe that we, it's something, it has something to do with us. It's about us. And that, that's really the point, isn't it? Isn't that what we do all the time? We are in a, a series called The Chain Reaction of Praise. And for those of you who have not, our guests this morning or have not come to the uh, auditorium service for years, we started this generation of the auditorium service with this series, and Keith led us in it when, when he launched uh, the current generation of auditorium services a couple of years ago. And it's very simple. There's a couple bookmarks back by the Bibles uh, in the cart there next to the sound booth. And it's very simple, this. We praise God in all circumstances, which activates our faith to pray powerful prayers, overcome evil, and learn to live and reign with Christ. So there's this chain reaction that happens. And we have been going through this again for a couple of reasons. One is that we, we have understood as a family journeying together in this room that God keeps leading us back to this chain reaction of praise. It keeps coming up again and again and again and again. And we just thought it's been a few years since we went through it, and now is a good time to just revisit it. So that's what we're doing. And to, this week, uh, Keith launched us again with praising God in all circumstances last week, and this week we're talking about activating our faith. I want you to understand, though, that there is an opposite chain reaction. Understand that. It's sort of like in Galatians 5, where it gives the fruit of the Spirit. But before it gives the fruit of the Spirit, it gives the fruit of darkness, if you want to check that out. See, there's always this light and darkness. There's always this contrast, good and evil. And so just as there is a chain reaction of praise, there is a chain reaction, I would call it a chain reaction of me. That when something happens, I curse my circumstances. Maybe I curse God. Why me? And when we, when we curse our circumstances, that activates our doubt. 
And when our doubt is activated, we grumble and complain, which empowers the darkness and keeps us separated from the person that God wants us to be. So when we encounter those circumstances, Keith talked about last week, when those things happen, we have a choice to make in that moment. I can choose to praise God, which will have its chain reaction spiritually, or I can choose to ask why me, and it will have its chain reaction. So the question this morning is, where are you at with the circumstances that God has put you in? And the reality is, these things, these circumstances come up over and over and over again. From little things that don't work out the way we want them to big tragedies of life. And even as I been preparing this week and praying about this service. I've been thinking about all of us, you and me, the family in this room, the stories that we've heard, the one that we heard last week and the testimony, the testimonies we heard from Brian a few uh, months ago, a month ago or so. When our plans for life and our plans for how we think life should look like are suddenly dashed when my hotel room is broken into and everything is stolen, when the police show up at our door with an arrest warrant, when the doctor says, you have cancer, when the doctor says, your cancer is growing and the meds aren't working, when the basement floods and ruins a whole bunch of sentimental treasures because the sump pump wasn't pushed in, plug wasn't pushed in all the way. When your child says, you need to know that I was sexually assaulted. When we get laid off from work, or when that job that I've been pushing for and wanting gets given to somebody else. When I keep pushing and pushing and pushing and nothing seems to work. When my car breaks down and I had to fix it, and I don't know how I'm going to get the money for food this week. When our spouse leaves. When the divorce papers are delivered. When my daughter says unexpectedly, I'm pregnant. When the pregnancy test is negative again. These are all examples from my life and your lives that I've heard from this room over the last couple of years. And there are more. There's some that that you're thinking about right now where you're at in life right now that you're feeling that maybe nobody knows but you. See, this is life. It is a process. And time and time again, God is going to bring us back. Why? Because Hebrews 11, 6 says, it is without faith, it is impossible to please God. Think about that for a second. Without faith, without this process of faith and the the chain reaction where it leads, we cannot please God. But how often do we substitute faith with something else? Oh, I need to be perfect in order to please God. I need to give up my sin in order to please God. I need to fill in the blank. I need to read my Bible every day in order to please God. I need to come to church every time. I need to give all my money in order to please God. We, we always put something on in our, our expectation of what's, what we need to do to please God when God comes back to, no, just believe. Because he knows that in the chain reaction of praise, if we come to him with faith in all circumstances, all of those other things will take care of themselves. Because 
we will progress spiritually the way that he calls us to do. But it begins with faith. And faith does not spring from safety and security and prosperity and success. You don't need faith. Recount all the miracles of Jesus. The people who came to him. Think about the woman who'd been bleeding for years and she thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. Think about the centurion, the Roman centurion whose child was dying, who reaches out to this Jewish teacher. Think about the blind and the deaf and the lame and the poor and the hungry that came to Jesus. Why? Because they came to him out of desperation. They had nowhere else to turn. And that activated their faith. And whenever Jesus did the miracle, he said, your faith has made this possible. Your faith has made you well. So when these circumstances happen, it is an opportunity either to go down the chain reaction of praise God, thank you that this is happening. I want to be in your will. Or the chain reaction of me. Why me? Woe is me. And grumbling and complaining. When we willfully choose to praise God in all circumstances, it activates our faith. Because number one, when it happens, I acknowledge it's not about me. Isn't that true? When I say, God, thank you for this tough time, praise you in the midst of my life that's crumbling and falling apart, praise you, we are saying there is something in this that is not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about the situation that I'm in. It is about what God wants to do in me. And that's the beginning. That allows that faith, in that praise, it allows it, and God begins to go, okay, you're beginning to get it. It's not about you. Because faith is what? The assurance of what we hope for. The evidence of what we don't see. So when I'm praising God, and and praise in that moment, like Keith talked about last week, praise in that moment, it's almost like a defiance against the darkness, isn't it? It's... I don't care what's happening. I am going to praise God. It's almost just like saying, darkness, be done. Tom, get out of here. I am going to focus on God. And it's that willful defiance against our circumstances that we begin to see not what's going to happen around me, but we begin to see it's the evidence of what we hope for, living and reigning in Christ. It's the evidence of what I don't see, which is what God is doing in me. We think a lot about, think about our mindset in our Western culture, that that success and prosperity is a ladder. Right? That's what we talk about. Got to climb the ladder of success. And so we think of that as being an ascent, of climbing higher. But God says, my ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. And Jesus, time and time and time again, said, look, the world is going this way. I'm calling you that way. The river of God flows upstream. He takes us against the current. And I want to submit to you today that perhaps our paradigm needs to change. That rather than thinking of spiritual progression as an ascent, an escalation, we need to understand that spiritual progress is a path of descent. What do you mean? When you are worried about yourself 
and you're doubting everything and you begin to grumble and complain and that creates conflicts and discord. And thing is, when things start getting heated and angry and conflictive, what do we call that? Escalation. I read this this week. The path of descent involves letting go of our self-image, our titles, our status symbols, our false self. It'll die anyway. So don't make anything absolute when it's only relative. This is one of the many meanings of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. We must let go of our false images of God, which mostly serve our purposes, and also our false images of ourself. The German mystic Meister Eckhart said, God is not found in the soul by adding anything, but by a process of subtraction. Here in the West, we think very differently. We all keep trying to climb higher, the ladder of success in any form. We've turned the gospel into a matter of addition rather than subtraction. All we can really do is get out of the way. The spiritual life is often more about unlearning than learning, letting go of our illusions more than continuing to add. See, that's the chain reaction of praise. When we praise, our faith is activated because we get out of the way. We're not focused on our problems. We're not focused on what's me. I'm focused on God, you. What are you doing? How can you be glorified in my life? My expectations and my illusions are gone, and my will becomes absorbed in his will. And what's really interesting about it is because when you you activate that faith and say, praise God, and say, now I'm going to believe, God, where you're leading me and where I'm going and where you want to lead me down this path, the miracle might happen like it did for all of the people that Jesus healed. But when our faith is activated, we also begin to understand that God will be praised and he will be glorified and that my life and will glorify God even if he doesn't do what I want him to do. Think about the disciples. So we, James, John, Peter, the boys. If you read through the Gospels, you find that time and time and time again, they came to Jesus with these questions. And even their mother, good little Jewish mother. Hey, Jesus, <laughs> which one of my sons is going to set out your right hand in heaven? What? what mom doesn't want her child to ascend to God's right hand? And time and time and time again, Jesus said, no, you don't understand. If you want to Live, you must die. If you want to climb higher, you must actually descend lower. If you want to lead, you must be a servant. If you want to be raised up, you must humble yourself. And so we have, we have these disciples who were so worried when they were with Jesus of what was going to happen, how, how they could become more and better and more important in his organization and in his ministry. Even Peter, when he denied Christ, said, no, I don't know the guy. What is he thinking about? Me. Look, Jesus has been arrested. There's a price on his head. If I acknowledge that in these circumstances that I am one of his followers, I might die. So no, I don't know Jesus. That's the chain reaction of me. But if you look at all of the disciples, I just saw this on Pinterest this, uh, this week. There was this great little graphic that went through and gave what tradition tells us about all 12 disciples of Jesus and what happened to them. And 11 of the 12 were martyred. 11 of the 12 were killed, and some of them in violent ways. And yet, they were full of faith and praise. In fact, James, who was one of, it was James' mother who said, hey, can, can my son sit at your right hand? And she said, no, if you want to live, you've got to die. And James was the first 
of Jesus' disciples to be martyred. And the tradition tells us that two different historians account that when James was executed, his faith and his testimony were so powerful that the executioner became a believer and was executed with him. When we give up ourselves, when our faith is activated, we begin to understand that God will be praised and God will be glorified and I will live and reign with Christ no matter what happens to me in this life. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember Sunday school? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Remember? King Nebuchadnezzar, the big idol on the plane. And he says, everybody's going to fall down and worship. And everybody, they play the band, and everybody falls down to worship the idol that he set up, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they bring him before the king. He has this fiery furnace, gets it up really hot, and he goes, I'm going to give you one more chance to play the music. You bow down to my idol, or I'm throwing you in the fiery furnace. Talk about a chain reaction of praise moment, huh? And in that moment, they said, King, understand this. Our God can save us from that fiery furnace. There's faith. He can. But we want you to know that even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image. He can save us. But even if he doesn't, there's faith. Evidence of what we hope for. Seeing things that we we can't see. And King Nebuchadnezzar throws him in the fiery furnace. And then he looks into the furnace and he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And one other person standing there having a fun old conversation. But whether we're saved from the furnace or not, see, that's the chain reaction of praise. With me out of the way, Christ can take me wherever it is he's going to lead me. Think about Jesus' parables of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee, the religious, the good, great guy, and then the tax collector. And Jesus said, look at that Pharisee, and he looks so good, and he's all religious, and he's got everything together, and he he looks like he's he's praying and everything. And then you look at the tax collector who just says, forgive me, God, I am a sinner. And who did Jesus say had the right way? The prodigal son. Was it the dutiful, obedient older son that was rewarded? No, it was the prodigal who was broken and humble and willing to be taught. See, that's the path of faith. That's the path of descent. Humility. Giving up myself. Allowing God to work. When we willfully choose to praise God in all circumstances, I want you to follow the progression here, I acknowledge it's not about me. With me out of the way, Christ can lead me where he's, where he's leading me, wherever that might be. And finally, I can believe that everything is going to be all right. I love the blues, and maybe it's because I'm a pessimist. I don't know. I've always loved the blues, B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Taj Mahal. I love the blues and listened to it my whole life. It, and, and what's interesting, when you study, the, you study music and you study the history of music, what you begin to understand is that there is a connection between the blues and gospel. It's almost like it's the prodigal son. Because the music, when you study the, the rhythms, you study the call and response, you study, it's, it's the, in blues you have some of the same 
musical themes, and you have some of the same progressions. Again, you have the call and response between the stage and the audience, and it's a lot like gospel. It's almost like the prodigal son in musical form. And one of the things that I've understood about blues as I've listened to it my whole life is that if you listen really carefully, a lot of times the blues leads back to hope. See, study the Psalms. The, I think David was the first blues man. I think he was. The Psalms are nothing but music lyrics, and most of them were written by King David. And if you read them time and time and time again, it's the blues, man. God, why have you forsaken me? God, why do my enemies in it? My baby doesn't let me. And yet, by the end of the psalm, he's saying, yet I will praise you. Yet I will hope in you. I know that you will deliver me. So if you're singing the blues this morning, understand that if you go down the chain reaction of me, nowhere it's going to lead. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. See, that's the thing about God, too, is he's not, you know, he's not like a school system that just keeps chucking people higher, you know, even if you don't pass, we just because we want to get you through and we want to get you on. God doesn't work that way. God's going to take us back to that same place over and over and over again until we learn the lesson. And even as we progress down the chain reaction of praise, I get better at it as I go along, but guess what? He keeps bringing me back to those circumstances. All right, God, I'm gonna praise you and activate my faith, and I'm gonna come down to you and say, oh, God, you've been so faithful, and guess what happens? Then the next week, something else is gonna happen, and I'm right back to the beginning, and I keep learning over and over and over again. Wendy and I were at a concert a couple of weeks ago for one of our favorite blues artists. His name's Johnny Lang, and uh, it's really hilarious because he is a really sweet-spirited white boy from North Dakota. Definitely not what you think of when you think of the blues. And yet God has just given him uh, an amazing, amazing gift. So we're there at the Riverside Casino in, uh, in I Iowa City, just south of Iowa City, and, and we're in this big ballroom and we're listening to the concert, and it's the blues, man. My baby done left me, my truck broke down, whatever it is, you know, just all this, you know, angst and wailing and everything. And then all of a sudden it got quiet and Johnny stepped up to the microphone and you need to know that Johnny Lang is also a believer. And he quietly began singing this song. And these are the words. We'll meet at the river. We'll be delivered from every chain. Down into the water, children, mothers, and fathers, in his sweet name. To drown all our sins and come up again forever changed. Never to return to the people we were for that great day. We'll patiently wait till we see his face. And when he appears, he'll wipe all our tears forever, always. And then we'll be together in heaven forever on that great day. I've been a Christian a long time, and I know when Holy Spirit enters a room. And as Johnny Lang began to sing that song, Wendy and I weren't even through the first line of the song, and tears were flowing down our face. And Holy Spirit entered the room. 
And as the singing went on, people began shouting praise. And people in that casino ballroom stood up and raised their hands and began to praise God. And we were in church. And Wendy and I are sitting there weeping, hardly able to contain Holy Spirit's thickness in that room. He went on to sing another song, and as he began to sing that song, he went into the phrase, everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And he sang it over and over again. Everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And then he told us to sing it, and we began singing, and people began to stand up. And, and, it, and that's the chain reaction of praise. So I'm here this morning to tell you everything is going to be all right. Give God your praise. Let him activate your faith. Be humble. Let yourself go. Step down from your expectations and your demands and your false self. Let us open ourselves to whatever Christ wants to do in us. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and let's pray together. God, I, um, in this moment, in the sweetness of this, this, this spirit, your spirit in this room, I just pray for every person who's sitting in this room right now, this morning, singing the blues, whose hearts are breaking, whose life's falling apart, who doesn't know how their ends are going to meet, every person who is struggling in a relationship, every person who is at the end of their rope. Remind us, God, this morning that faith doesn't spring from the mountaintop. It grows at the end of our rope. Give us the grace this morning to let go of ourselves, to praise you, and to believe. that you will always be there to catch us when we fall. And that when we fall, when we humbly bow, that's when you raise us up. Do your work and your will in us. We pray in the name of